Greetings. I'm Karen Engel, and I teach at the law school, and along with Neville Hode, who you were just hearing from, co-direct the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice. And it's my real pleasure to welcome you all to the final lecture in our fall 2021 colloquium. I can't believe we're at the final lecture. Um, the Colloquium in Equality, Labor, and Human Rights, the Future of Work in the Age of Pandemic. We're delighted to hear from Professor Alyssa Battistoni today, who will present her talk, Climate Futures and the Future of Work, Rethinking Green Jobs, Revaluing Care Work, and from Alex Beasley, who will respond. And I'll introduce them in a moment. First, I wanna say though that I'm also uh, happy to announce that this is the first event at the university to be co-sponsored by the Sissy Farenthold Fund for Peace and Social Justice. As some of you may know, Sissy passed away at the end of September, just shy of her 95th birthday. Um, she was a dear friend of and advisor to the Rappaport Center, as well as to me personally, and I know a number of you on this call. And she was there until the end. Um, and so it means a really a great deal that close to 40 of her family members and friends, largely encouraged by her son, George Ferenthold, who is often at these talks, I don't know if he's made it yet, um, but they began a memorial fund at the Rappaport Center that will continue Sissy's legacy by sponsoring work on a broad range of issues to which she was committed, including peace, environmental justice, and reproductive and sexual rights. And the fund is just beginning, but I have to say, I was reading Alyssa's paper a couple of weekends ago, and I was so thinking Sissy would love to be here in conversation with us. So we just thought we would announce it now um, and have the fund co-sponsor this event as a way to invoke her presence. Finally, as some of you know, this colloquium is also part of an interdisciplinary seminar that I co-teach with political geographer Nina Ebner, who uh, many of you, most of you know, and have been hearing from on chat, if as well as other ways. Um, so she's, uh, we teach the course here at the law school. Uh, we read and discussed Alyssa's work with our terrific group of 12 students last week. And we had a really lively discussion that we look forward to continuing today. Some of them have written reaction papers and we'll give them a chance to ask the first questions. So just before I, a couple of additional notes, um, this is a Zoom meeting, as you can see, uh, so that we can see each other uh, and engage in conversation. And you can certainly decide whether or not to turn your cameras on during the talk, but during the Q&A, we'd like to invite the seminar, the seminar students definitely, but anyone else who is interested as well to turn your cameras on if you've turned them off. Uh, we'll ask you to hold questions until the end of the presentations, and then we'll do questions by chat, and I'll say something about that before we start. So now I'm delighted to introduce Alyssa Battistoni, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Barnard College. She is a political theorist working on timely, urgent topics related to political economy, environmental politics, feminism, and the history of political thought. As you will see today, she's an important voice in an emerging scholarly and public conversation on degrowth, social reproduction, and work. She's co-author of A Planet to Win, We Need a New Green Deal, and is working on a book manuscript entitled Free Gifts, Capitalism, and the Politics of Nature. After Alyssa speaks, we're fortunate to hear from B. Alex Beasley as our respondent. Alex is assistant professor in the Department of American Studies here at UT and is published on the history of labor, business, gender and sexuality, cities and international relations. So it's sort of covering the gambit of sites and is currently finishing a book manuscript, Expert Capital, Houston and the Making of a Service Empire. Also a public scholar, Alex is the co-founder and former co-host of the best named podcast ever, who makes sense, but C-E-N-T-S, a history of capitalism. So uh, with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Stoney, however you choose to do that. 
and you can take it away, Alyssa. Thank you for being here. Great. Thank you so much, Karen, for that introduction. And thank you again, everyone, for, um, for both being here and for your patience as I tried to sort out um, my technical difficulties, which you would think after so much time on Zoom um, would be uh, totally managed, but um, there's always something new. So I'm going to try sharing my screen and hopefully after all of that, it will actually work. Um, and if not, then I'm just going to have Nina uh, do it and, and it might be a little messier than it would be otherwise. But um, is, that, is that visible to everyone? Yes, yes, visible. <laughs> Very happy to hear it. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to, um, I will get started. Um, and uh, um, yeah, okay, great. So I'll just, I'll just start from there. So um, um, yeah, so as, as, um, as Karen mentioned, my, my talk is called Climate Features and the Future of Work. Um, rethinking Green Jobs, Revaluing Care Work, and um, I am going to touch a little bit on um, uh, some of the, the talking, what we say about work and, and a planet to win, um, but also more specifically on some of the, um, the work I've done on care work specifically um, beyond that. So, okay. Um, great. So when Joe Biden spoke at COP26 uh, in Glasgow two weeks ago, he said, when I talk to the American people about climate change, I tell them it's about jobs. Um, and he does indeed. Uh, since Biden introduced his Build Back Better plan as a presidential candidate in the summer of 2020, he's repeated a version of the statement many times. When I think about climate change, I think about jobs. Biden's emphasis on jobs as a climate policy is the most recent answer to uh, one of the most enduring tensions of environmental politics, um, the jobs versus environment framing that's plagued efforts to adopt environmental protections for decades since at least the 1970s. The research is periodically but gained new traction in the 2016 presidential election when Donald Trump promised to repeal the, quote, job killing environmental regulations of the Obama administration and decried Obama's supposed war on coal. So Biden follows in the tradition of many advocates of green jobs um, and suggesting that uh, environmental protections don't have to threaten economic growth or livelihoods. Um, I would suggest we should probably segregate those, but we can get into that more. Um, and then promising to put people to work in ways that are um, in some way uh, good for the environment or at least not harmful to it. Um, but when Joe Biden thinks about jobs, what kinds of jobs does he think about? Um, in Biden's comments, uh, uh, both at COP and, and, and his other sort of um, speeches he's given on, on climate um, and in mainstream discourse, green jobs tend to mean jobs in energy infrastructure. So workers installing solar panels, building electric vehicle charging stations, uh, weatherizing homes, building electric vehicles, and so on. Um, and these kinds of work are important. Um, it's imperative to transition away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible, and doing so will require um, various forms of both large-scale industrial production and deployment through, um, through various ways, including potentially public works projects. Um, but what I want to argue is that producing and installing uh, the likes of solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles, and other components of energy infrastructure um, especially on the scale required for a rapid energy transition is not a viable long-term strategy for either economic or ecological sustainability. Um, I wanna propose that we would need to think um, uh, more broadly and deeply about um, what it would mean to remake the economy. And that means thinking more broadly about what kinds of work we value and which kinds of jobs count as green jobs. Um, so again, in Planet to Win, we talk more um, about a, a number of different pieces of a sort of labor um, vision for labor and climate politics in the chapter Strike for Sunshine in particular. Um, and there we draw on, for example, the idea of the just transition um, uh, developed by the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union and other um, uh, blue-green labor environment coalitions, um, a job guarantee that could give workers real alternatives to environmentally destructive work, um, measures that can strengthen workers' rights to organize um, and uh, protections for workers on the job, um, and envision how we can both transform work, make work better, but also reduce the amount of work we do. Um, but what I'm going to focus on in this talk is our argument for expanding this vision of green jobs to include work which sustains and improves human life and non-human life in low-carbon ways, and um, that in particular the case for seeing care work as a form of green job as key to the future of work and our climate change future. Um, 
And I'll talk a bit about both the structure of that work as it is now and uh, how it might change and how um, care workers in particular might help lead some of that change. So um, why should we see care work as a kind of green job? Um, in short, um, although uh, labor movements in the 19th and 20th centuries insisted that workers had built the world in most, the most literal sense, um, I think the labor movement of the 20th century really needs to foreground the workers who will make it possible to live in that world for generations to come. Um, the kind of work we'll need more of in a climate stable future is work that's oriented towards improving and sustaining human life and the lives of other species that share and make our worlds, work that makes people's lives better without consuming huge amounts of resources, generating significant carbon emissions, or producing um, ever more stuff. Work that is that meets people's needs rather than chasing profits. Care work is um, one exemplary version uh, version of this work, and I would say it's crucial um, both to a just and decent society and to an ecologically viable one in which quality of life is prioritized over quantity of goods. Um, we can think, for example, of the work of um, thinkers like the political theorist and feminist theorist Joan Tronto, who argues um, that care is a, a crucial part of the good life. Tronto says, We've got things backwards now. The key to living well for all people is to live a care-filled life, a life in which one is well cared for by others when one needs it, cares well for oneself and has room to provide for caring. The purpose of economic life is to support care, not the other way around. Production is not an end in itself. It's a means to the end of living as well as we can. And in a democratic society, she says this means everyone can live well, not just the few. Um, unfortunately, not everyone today is living well. We're living amidst what the political theorist Nancy Fraser has called a crisis of care. Um, there's a growing need of care of many kinds, elder care, child care, health care, which many people don't have access to and cannot afford. The COVID-19 pandemic has cast this uh, ongoing crisis into particularly stark relief. Many people have struggled to access necessary care, um, particularly working class people and people of color. Meanwhile, caregivers, both waged and unwaged, um, have borne the brunt of underinvestment in public health and caregiving. Uh, healthcare workers have been stretched thin, responding to waves of infection, have themselves been disproportionately subject to COVID infection. Um, this closure of schools and daycares has driven millions of women, again, particularly working class women and women of color, to drop out of the labor force in order to meet family caregiving needs. Um, I would say that the pandemic has also uh, highlighted the importance of a political project that can tackle both the crisis of care and the, cli uh, the climate crisis at the same time, particularly since climate change itself will uh, drive the emergence of new diseases as wildlife habitation and migration patterns change and intersect with human activity in new ways. Um, more generally, climate change is likely to increase the need for care in response to climate field disasters and deteriorating in environmental conditions. Um, yet, even as care is desperately needed, the people who provide it are poorly paid and tend to work under um, often fairly poor conditions. So recognizing, um, uh, arguing for care work as a form of green job means rethinking what work is, who does it, and how it's valued. Um, and in particular, I'm going to emphasize the ways that centering care in our economy requires a reckoning with the ways that care work has been devalued by capitalism and shaped by a gendered and racialized division of labor. Um, so um, I'll sort of start with that latter piece in, in a way. So um, if we look, uh, for example, at the, the kinds of green jobs as traditionally envisioned, um, those sort of like uh, the, the jobs in that first screen, um, the various kind of construction hard hat jobs, um, and the ones I just outlined, the kind of care work as green jobs vision, um, they're done by very different groups of people, divided most obviously along lines of gender, um, there's some stats up here that I'm not going to read out, but we'll throw up with apologies for the pretty um, uh, binary presentation of these statistics, but that's what we have. So um, both jobs in extractive industries and in green sectors as traditionally conceived are dominated by men. By contrast, work and care and related industries is predominantly done by women. Um, so there's this pretty stark divide uh, in the, the kinds of traditional view of green jobs and the kinds of um, uh, jobs I'm calling for. Um, and that's, I think, if we're if the aim is to move people out of extractive industry work uh, into an economy organized more around caring for each other on the planet, I think we need to confront sort of um, this uh, this gender this gender divide as um, a crucial component to understanding um, what this work is. 
So we often see um, the, uh, the gender division of labor as discussed in terms of socialization, stigma, and stereotypes. Um, you know, uh, perceptions of women as naturally nurturing and caring mean that they're considered uh, suited to these jobs and um, conversely that men are seen as not suited to doing them. Um, so this is a kind of, um, and we see these sorts of stories often uh, in, 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 or this framing in news articles um, suggesting that men just don't want to do women's work because of the stigma. Um, but I really want to emphasize um, that the ostensibly cultural aspects of gendered labor are inseparable from economic ones, if not reducible to them. So feminized labor um, describes not, uh, not only the prevalence of women in a workforce or cultural connotations associated with the kind of work, uh, but the condition of irregular, often part-time work that's paid less than a living wage, um, often reflecting a historical expectation um, that, uh, that that work is done by um, someone providing a secondary income to the breadwinner income earned um, uh, by presumably their husbands. Um, and these conditions are really prevalent in the care work sector, uh, which is one of the lowest paying jobs in the United States. Um, so uh, most, most healthcare support jobs um, pay in the range of thirty to forty thousand dollars annually. Um, home health aides make just twenty six thousand dollars annually, and home health aides are one of the fastest growing um, job categories in the U.S. today. Um, Seventy six percent of women working in adult home care earn less than fifteen dollars per hour. Um, and these low wage jobs in care are stratified by race as well as gender, which I think offers further evidence that economic imperatives um, are, uh, are, are um, more operative than cultural stigma. So um, black men, for example, are three times more likely to take lower, um, lower rung uh, healthcare jobs than uh, white men. Other men of color are also significantly more likely to take um, healthcare jobs in these lower wage levels as nurses or aides rather than doctors. Um, and many of the worst paid jobs, um, like those of home health aides and domestic workers, are done by women of color, often immigrants. So this is a problem for the people currently doing these jobs who often struggle to support themselves um, and their families, but also for a Green New Deal for care. Um, it is already a challenge to ensure that green jobs are as good as the ones they promise to replace. Um, so, for example, the annual average annual pay for coal mining is around um, $86,000. Uh, annually, workers in oil and gas are often paid more. Um, oil and gas work is often fairly sort of boom bust, so it may not be like a super stable job um, paying that rate, but you can make a lot of money uh, without an advanced degree or any kind of degree at all. Um, so there is, uh, you know, people, people can make a, a good living in this work. Skilled work on renewable energy, meanwhile, um, often comes with lower, um, lower wages. So uh, solar installers and uh, turbine technicians um, are paid approximately $46,000 and $57,000 re respectively. Um, and as we've seen, uh, care, work, um, care workers are often paid much less than that. So um, uh, again, although we have these, these sorts of the growth of, of jobs in these industries in care uh, and the broader care economy is really booming and um, a huge source of job growth, um, but it is not, those jobs are not at the level of, um, of, of sort of even, uh, they, they have, un, their wages are lower than um, wages in general, um, and certainly much, much lower uh, than, in, you know, the jobs in this, this sort of extractive industry I've been discussing. Um, so, you know, there is uh, the projected growth in home health aids from 2016 to 2026 is estimated to be 86 times the growth in wind turbine service technicians, um, but uh, the wind turbine service technicians are paid um, about twice as much as the home health aids. So um, if we're talking about what is an alternative green job, that is, you know, that is a real challenge. Um, and in fact, in many places, the transition from extractive industry to care work is actually already underway. So for example, in Letcher County, Kentucky, the gender balance of the workforce has shifted drastically in the past decade as coal mining jobs have disappeared. Um, and uh, usually uh, women have become the family breadwinners. Um, but because the jobs that they get, usually in healthcare, pay less than extractive industry work, household incomes have suffered, and people experience that shift from extractive to care uh, the extractive a care, to a care economy as a downgrade in their quality of life. Um, so you can understand why people would not be very excited about that as a prospect. Um, so 
you know, I want to argue that that's not an inherent thing to care work or that doesn't have to be that way. Both better pay and more recognition for these kinds of work are necessary for building um, a low carbon economy that is also um, a source of good livelihoods for people um, and for addressing a division of labor that gives uh, women and people of color the worst paid and lowest status jobs. Um, and that means in turn that um, that those workers will have to uh, demand recognition and compensation for their work. And I'll say more about that shortly. Um, before I get to that, I want to talk about another kind of care work and this is care for the earth. So um, climate breakdown uh, also demands that we take better care, uh, not only of each other, but also of our planet. Um, and like the work of caring for and reproducing uh, human life, um, the what we might think of as the work done by the life support systems of planet earth, the carbon cycle, water purification, soil fertility, and many other processes that make uh, uh, life on earth possible have often been treated as background conditions against which the formal economy can function. Um, but they are obviously crucial to maintaining a habitable planet and a livable human future on it. So I wanna um, suggest that our understanding of the crisis of care should encompass the multi-species relationships necessary for sustaining life on this earth. Um, the web of life on which we depend is breaking down. It needs care, repair, and maintenance. So um, that means in turn that we need to, again, support and expand forms of work oriented towards caring for those ecosystems that keep the earth habitable. Um, this is the kind of work that the ecofeminist Ariel Saleh uh, might call meta-industrial work. Um, and when it comes to policy uh, uh, measures, the sort of obvious example is the um, New Deal Civilian Conservation Corps. That's the image on the top uh, left over there. Um, and CCC, uh, in terms of a model of a sort of green jobs program focused on care for the earth, um, although the CCC, some of the work was care for the earth, some probably was not, but uh, they did perform a wide array of tasks, including uh, forest and soil conservation, um, the construction of hiking trails and recreational facilities, flood control, disaster relief. So um, we've seen a lot of proposals for a um, civilian climate core, including in the Build Back Better plan, um, uh, and, uh, you know, a renewed CCC, people have argued, could, um, again, conserve and restore public lands, uh, support reforestation, uh, try to increase various forms of carbon sequestration, protect biodiversity, um, and respond to the claim changing climate in other ways. Um, I think we could think expansively about the ways that a, uh, a renewed CCC could restore areas that have been damaged by industrial production, um, like the hundreds of Superfund sites that remain awaiting cleanup in the U.S. Um, in cities, a CCC could employ people to plant trees uh, that, and gardens that can improve quality of life, absorb carbon, and keep cities cooler amidst heat waves. Um, and ecological restoration can help, uh, as that example suggests, with both mitigation and adaptation. So both with um, the process of sequestering carbon, but also with um, responding to uh, the kinds of effects that we know climate change is likely to have. So we might think, for example, of um, a project to restore Louisiana's wetlands, um, which could employ thousands of former uh, oil and gas workers to dismantle the miles of gas pipelines crisscrossing the disappearing marshes of Louisiana um, uh, and helping to protect New Orleans and other coastal communities from storm surges. So, um, uh, so ecosystem restoration as a, as a crucial part of a sort of revived CCC. Um, and I'll say here that while the original um, CCC was pretty intensely gendered, it was really framed as a way to turn, um, uh, in some ways to turn these, these sort of um, uh, sickly city boys into, into strapping men. There's some like pretty um, interesting imagery around the old CCC. Um, it was also, uh, CCC camps were often segregated. Um, so there's a, a real gendered and racialized um, imaginary of the CCC. Um, but, you know, the contemporary CCC, I think, is much more, um, has a very different vision of what that work is and who would do it. Um, uh, it's certainly uh, less strongly, in, uh, in, in some ways, the, there's less of a sort of attachment to what, who does this kind of work, because there are actually so few of those kinds of jobs, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, but the most salient thing, um, or sort of um, demographic category we might think of with respect to um, these particular kinds of work is, is age. Um, this work where it's done at all is typically done via programs like AmeriCorps, um, oriented towards young people who are working in a sort of quasi-volunteer nature. Um, 
And that's in part because the pay for this work tends to be also very low. Um, but care for the work also uh, care for the earth also has to extend beyond explicit conservation programs and integrate into other forms of work, particularly agricultural uh, practices. Contemporary ag American agriculture does not take much care for the earth or for those who work it. Um, it's really it aims to produce as much as possible as cheaply po as possible um, while pushing uh, both workers and soils to exhaustion. Um, and again, this this process of addressing, I think. Um, the, the exploitative nature of contemporary agriculture also entails reckoning with the exploitation of farm workers, many of whom are undocumented immigrants, vulnerable to intense exploitation and excluded from many forms of labor protection. Um, finally, and crucially, um, Care for the Earth uh, must draw on indigenous knowledge, recognizing indigenous communities as leaders in ecological restoration and care, um, much of which they have already been doing. So here, um, uh, we could think of uh, the Lakota scholar Nick Essie's argument that, quote, the relationship indigenous caretakers have with the land, water, air, and non-human world is typically not viewed as productive, like unwaged caregiving work, land defense, and water protection are undervalued but necessary for the continuation of life on a planet teetering on collapse. So um, care, care for the earth and care um, for human beings are often um, devalued in similar ways. Um, and we uh, could endorse, for example, the Red Nation's call to center multi-species caretaking in a Green New Deal or in the Red Deal program that they've put forward. Um, but again, besides the small number of conservation jobs, ecological care work really is not a recognized or paid form of work in the contemporary American economy almost at all, um, meaning that programs for ecological restoration and maintenance would have to be intentionally created and for the most part publicly funded. This is not really work um, that is likely to be profitable. We shouldn't expect the private sector to provide them. Okay, so these are a couple um, given sort of an argument for, for different ways of thinking about care in relation to um, climate and, and different kinds of care work in relation to climate. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the political argument for focusing um, both for thinking about care workers um, as part of the Green New Deal coalition and, um, and how we might imagine that uh, the politics of care playing out. Um, so I, um, you know, I want to emphasize that the argument for focusing on care workers isn't only a matter of principles, um, it's also practical. To see care work as a future of work is to offer a political vision that recognizes the American working class as it is today, rather than invoking an, uh, an image of the post-war past. Um, and it's a vision that has a potential to broaden the Green New Deal coalition to um, include a wider range of workers in the communities they serve. Um, so the historian Gabriel Winant argues that, quote, to imagine we should look for class and see hard hats uh, mistakes a particular historical manifestation, the industrial working class for a general category whose ranks are always changing. Um, and there were a lot of hard hats in those first, that first set of images of green jobs they showed. Um, but today, again, the, um, the ranks of the working class in who are, who are working in uh, care and service work are really growing. Um, and so while coalitions of environmentalists and unions have traditionally focused on workers and extractive and, and other um, sort of environmentally harmful industries, um, a labor program that's just about transitioning those workers to green, uh, to green jobs doesn't bring enough workers into the Green New Deal fight. There are presently less than um, 50,000 coal miners working in the US, um, around 1.4 million uh, oil and gas workers, or at least there were um, uh, when I wrote this, this is <laughs> oil and gas work uh, employment has uh, fluctuated quite a bit over the past year or so with the fluctuating um, uh, price of oil. So that, um, you know, that has, that is a, um, a fluctuating number. Um, but in any case, there are roughly 18 million healthcare workers and 3.6 million teachers already doing low carbon work. Um, and these workers are part of a labor movement that's, that's fighting for good union jobs in connection to a larger expansion of uh, public goods and services while often undertaking um, new kinds of organizing that reaches beyond the workplace. So, um, uh, they've also been at the forefront of labor militancy in recent years. Um, in 2018, for example, the, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported 20 major work stoppages in which 485,000 workers went out on strike. And 
uh, workers in education, healthcare, and social assistance uh, accounted for over 90% of those workers. They were half of strikes in the decade between 2009 and 2018. Um, we could think, for example, of um, Bread for Ed's uh, organizing around um, both higher pay and more public investment. And I'll say more about um, some teachers union organizing in a minute. Um, of course, there's been an uh, um, intensification of, of um, uh, of protest and, and struggle by care workers in the past uh, year and a half in response to the pressures of um, the pandemic. And that's a, the image that you see um, on this slide. Um, you know, we are seeing an uptick in, um, in, in labor activity and militancy and other kinds of work now, which is also very exciting, but um, this, these sectors have been uh, really, um, have been doing that kind of work uh, prior to the pandemic as well. Um, and so, uh, so there's both exciting things happening within these sectors, um, and they also are pioneering new ways of organizing um, that can connect to the working class more broadly. So Jane McAlevey, the labor organizer and theorist, argues that uh, unions win when they do what she calls whole worker organizing, and that's organizing that sees workers as connected to broader communities um, and that organizes those communities alongside them. Um, when unions fight and win this way, she argues the whole community wins too, and that can build the foundation uh, both for stronger relationships and future um, gains. So um, these kinds of organizing strategies have really been developed by the workers doing some of the kinds of work I've described here. Um, uh, the uh, Chicago Teachers Union and United Teachers of Los Angeles, for example, have organized in the workplace and in the community um, on a model known as bargaining for the common good. Um, uh, that, that reflects a lot of um, these, these sort of principles and ideas. Um, and so uh, in, in LA, for example, when teachers uh, went on strike in 2019, um, a number of people from the community uh, went out in support with them and they ended up winning, um, uh, winning a lot of what they asked for. They want a better contract with more teachers, more counselors, more nurses, an immigrant defense fund, a commitment to green spaces and gardens. Um, in short, a lot of things that we could imagine as sort of the, the inklings of uh, a Green New Deal um, or that, that um, are in line with the vision of the Green New Deal that I've been outlining here. And I think this framework, bargaining for the common good, although it has been largely um, uh, developed by public sector workers, doesn't have to be just for public sector workers. So we could think, for example, of a coalition of uh, construction workers unions um, and housing movements uh, organizing around a commitment to building um, dense, low carbon public housing on a mass scale. Um, uh, or for example, uh, of the example that Stefania Barca gives in uh, her article of Toronto, the steel, the Italian steel mill community where uh, steel mill workers and community members organize around the cancer risks posed by the plant. Um, so there's a lot of uh, potential coalition building to be had here. Um, and I just wanna emphasize that these expansive or, uh, approaches to organizing are really crucial for addressing climate change. Um, Climate change is a problem which is embedded in the patterns of daily life. And so um, the political struggles around it have to be too. Um, the Green New Deal for Care suggests that we need to change more than our energy sources. And I think we can see the desire for that kind of transformation already latent in many contemporary struggles um, and demands for Medicare for all and public childcare um, and struggles to improve wages and working conditions for care workers and calls for care, not cause. A Green New Deal for Care can help bring these struggles together, um, demanding new ways of organizing both social and ecological reproduction in service of a future where everyone has what they need to live a healthy and fulfilling life on a habitable planet. Um, so I've been suggesting some of the ways that care work can help bring build practical coalitions for a Green New Deal, uh, but I want to just conclude um, by acknowledging some of the challenges which remain, um, and this is in part in response to the excellent response papers uh, by Sarah Evers, Christian Vaughn, and Evan Snyder, um, who I'm, I'm excited to hear will be also posing questions at the end of the talk. Um, but uh, I will, um, uh, I'm going to respond at least to some of what, um, what you all said here. So um, Christian and Sarah asked in particular um, about uh, about many things, but in part about feasibility in the present political context. Evan asked about whether and how the vision uh, we lay out in A Planet to Win and the vision of the Green New Deal for Care connects to projects like degrowth, um, as Stefania Barca um, uh, outlines it. 
And I think these are really great questions that speak to precisely the difficult balancing act um, that the Green New Deal and the radical Green New Deal that um, we outlined in a planet to win in particular um, is trying to strike. So um, the great problem of climate politics is really that many of the things that we need to do are not presently feasible, um, while the things that we uh, can do that are politically feasible are not adequate to the challenge. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think there isn't a, a sort of an easy way to cut through that problem. Um, if there were, we probably would have solved the climate crisis by now. But what I see the project of the Green New Deal is trying to do is to, on the one hand, push the edge of what does seem politically feasible, um, to put more challenging ideas on the table, to point out the drastic changes that we need to make across our society and economy, um, and then to connect some of those bigger visions to real organizing projects, concrete policies, and political strategies. Um, and I really, you know, this is how I see the connection between somebody like Stefania's work um, and, and mine. I think we share a lot of vision and analysis, but um, uh, much of the, a lot of the difference comes in, I think, the, the effort to connect some of those bigger orient ideas to contemporary programs and projects. Um, and I think, to be honest, that the Green New Deal has been remarkably successful in many of these respects, even if it has not yet sort of uh, fully address the problem of climate change. So um, the conversation around climate really has changed pretty drastically in, in recent years. Um, as a historian Adam Tu has argued recently in The Guardian, the strategic analysis of the Green New Deal has been spectacularly vindicated. Um, we've seen growing energy on the progressive wing of the Democratic Party for Green New Deal type policies at national, state, and local levels. Um, and a growing number of elected officials who have um, both championed the Green New Deal and are, are um, working on figuring out how to make these connections across uh, visions and movements. Um, so uh, Representative Cory Bush, for example, has done really important work to flesh out the environmental justice components of the Green New Deal and connect it to movements for racial justice. In Pennsylvania, Nikhil Saval was elected running on a Green New Deal ballot platform and endorsed by both the Sunrise Movement and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Um, again, seeing that climate labor coalition um, in reality. Uh, Michelle Wu was just elected mayor of Boston uh, with a platform that emphasized the Green New Deal and measures like free public transit. Um, we've also seen a number of uh, Green New Deal related pieces of legislation introduced into Congress. Um, including the Green New Deal for Public Housing Act, which would retrofit public housing to be energy efficient while creating jobs for public housing, uh, uh, people who are living in public housing. Um, the Bill of Green Infrastructure and Jobs Act, which would have invested uh, $500 billion in electrified mass transit. Um, again, really focusing on sort of um, public goods as a, a central piece of infrastructure rather than only the kind of um, uh, electric vehicle oriented vision. Um, uh, and a number of other another acts that have been introduced, not necessarily because they are going to be immediately passed. I think everyone realizes that they're not, um, but they can, again, signal important ideas um, that climate and other political groups can talk about and organize around. Um, and these ideas have significantly sh uh, shaped the Biden administration's approach to climate change. Um, although he never endorsed the Green New Deal per se, he has certainly moved in that direction. The Build Back Better framework envisions a climate policy that's also an industrial policy that proposes to make public investments in green infrastructure, um, uh, targeting job creation, as we heard in the very beginning, um, and prioritizing investments in uh, frontline communities. And Biden himself has never been a climate champion. Um, so I think that we can only read the shift as, as um, the reflection of a changing political dynamic, a combination of pressure from climate activists and recognition that he has to address economic, social, and racial inequalities with robust action. We've also had a major conversation about whether care should count as infrastructure and proposed massive investments in care work that would have potentially transformed both the conditions of care work and access to it um, across the country. That said, it's obvious that this, um, you know, the action has not matched up to the rhetoric um, that we haven't achieved um, many of these goals and that there are serious political obstacles. Um, you know, I think 
uh, I understand that there are serious political challenges to the passage of more ambitious legislation, um, most notably in uh, recent weeks, the ability of a very small number of senators to obstruct legislation. Um, but I think it's really vital that in recognizing the limitations of contemporary politics, we don't lose sight of how far um, the climate movement and conversation have moved in the past few years. And I wanna really emphasize the political problems we face are not specific to climate change, although some of them, um, uh, the particular dynamics of climate change uh, exacerbate some of them. And um, there, are, there are unique and distinctively difficult dynamics of climate change, um, but we also have to um, uh, consider the ways, uh, the, the political problems facing the US and US institutions more generally um, reflecting uh, in many ways, the sclerotic state of our undemocratic and increasingly illegitimate political institutions, the longer standing structures of work, gender and race that I've been describing here. So I would say that rather than attempting to craft a climate policy that can somehow get through the system as climate activists have repeatedly tried and failed to do over the past two decades, um, we really need to address those um, anti-democratic dimensions of US politics um, while also continuing to build and support growing movements that connect climate change to other social needs. Jobs, yes, but also housing and transportation to name two of the most crucial. And part of that project entails outlining a vision of what we want and organizing people to fight for it. So um, I think that both Green New Deal style policies are here to stay. And of course, so is the climate crisis. Uh, there are many challenges ahead of us and I'm, I'm excited to, to hear um, your thoughts on what those are and what we can do about them. Uh, but I'll leave it here for now. Thank you so much for listening. I'm really looking forward to Alex's comments and to all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, and I'm glad you had a chance to take on some of the questions as well already. And Alex is back with us, which we are very happy to see. And um, I'll turn, turn the podium over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Continuing in the um, technical difficulties uh, realm, I just Zoom completely crashed on me midway through and I have not been able to get it back up on my computer at all, but it's working on my phone. So we'll be, you know, doing it this way. Uh, but it's, you know, um, uh, thanks again uh, for having me. And Alyssa, just thank you so much for such a, you know, vitally important, really thought provoking, and ultimately, I think, optimistic paper that, you know, I certainly, the, the way that you closed this with um, you know, some optimism for, for the future and some focus on how far the, the, how far we've come in terms of the conversation about climate change, um, is, is something I certainly needed to hear in this, in this moment. And it's, it's a really powerful reminder that there are so many opportunities for us to push this conversation in certain directions that, you know, are, are so vital to, um, both the present and to the future. So. I want to focus in my comments mostly on drawing out some of the, I think, broader points and implications of your argument, and then focusing my questions really around a couple of keywords that stood out to me. Mostly, I, I want to draw those words out to kind of problematize them and to ask what a focus on them might help us figure out in terms of approaching this conversation and trying to, um, you know, draw out a political vision um, and mobilize people behind a, a political vision that matches, you know, what needs to happen for all of our futures. So one of the things that really struck me about this piece and about thinking uh, about care work in the language of, you know, environmental futures was something that I've, you know, I've reflected on many times, but not really in this way. And that is the, what kind of problem reproductive labor is in terms of how it's treated by capitalism, in terms of how we all treat it and think about it culturally, the problem that it is for, um, for gender and for, you know, questions of value. And it struck me that the problem that we face now um, about how to think about reproductive labor and what 
what the work of reproductive labor as a category is in the broader economic calculus is quite different from the problem that it posed, you know, earlier in the history of capitalism. So if we think about the kind of prototypical, you know, way that we tend to think about the problem of care work, if we think of a um, kind of iconic uh, nuclear family mid-century household with the expectation or the assumption that you're going to have an industrial worker who is a man who is earning a family wage that is enough to support his um, his wife and his children, and that that is going to be you know the family the family wage that sustains the entire family and kind of the unpaid labor of um, the unpaid reproductive labor of his wife is the labor that is in you know invisible is not recognized and it is what make is making his own production possible. It strikes me that that's a somewhat you know, of, of course, I want to recognize that that was never the uh, the arrangement that was accessible to all people or even most people, but that was kind of the iconic model of kind of mid-century capitalism. Um, but it strikes me that, you know, what we are up against now when it comes to reproductive labor and care work is just a quite different problem. And the problem now is very much the fact that care labor is not invisible or that it's not invisible in the same ways um, or that there are components of it that are not invisible. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I would, I would argue, and um, I think this is certainly open to discussion that we have seen, you know, an increasing commodification of care work in uh, certainly the past 50 years in which um, the, the kind of work that maybe historically would have been done by unseen or unpaid um, women is increasingly being done for profit, um, often as parts of large corporations that are directly profiting from organizing that labor. You mentioned home health care. That's certainly a terrific example. There are now kind of home health care agencies um, all over the country. And the the people who work for them are often categorized a lot more like an Uber contractor than like a nurse who is employed by a hospital um, with, of course, the benefit of that mostly accruing to the company that employs them. Um, this is not to say that all reproductive labor was um, historically unpaid and now it is paid, but I think there has been, you know, as you say, there has been a commodification of social services and that a big part of the movement around care work has been about arguing for recognition of that labor, but also a decommodification of it, um, a way of thinking of it outside of the kind of profit relation. And so it, it seems like we could trace a line between, you know, a push for wages for housework, you know, as an iconic movement, or, you know, in, in say the 1970s, to now we're seeing a lot of this reproductive labor, you know, more and more as a commodity. But this has led to a race to the bottom in terms of how little corporations can compensate people for this labor and the kind of extreme and extended extraction of value from the people doing that kind of work. So if we see the kind of mid-century family wage assuming the unpaid labor of women um, and assigning the, you know, the, the value of that labor to their husbands. So for instance, if you're, if you're a man being paid a family wage, part of what's rolled into that wage is the kind of presumed labor that your spouse is doing, but it's going to you as the man, not to your spouse. The new order is kind of transforming that formerly unpaid labor into low wage labor that is constructed as unskilled labor. So it seems to me that there's really a two pronged problem here. And I think you, you draw this out in the paper. On the one hand, we need to draw attention to care workers as workers and worker and care workers, of course, are already doing that, demanding better compensation um, and their centrality to social life and to the good life. But also uh, at the same time, a resistance to the concept that care work is just another profit maker for capital and an insistence on the extra economic value of care. And I think holding both of those ideas at the same time can sometimes be a bit challenging. Um, 
And it strikes me that, you know, to put this all back into conversation with, um, you know, ecological value, it seems quite akin to thinking about externalities in the language of, of capitalism and how there's a long going conversation in environmental economics about, you know, what does it mean to count environmental destruction as an externality, something that doesn't have to appear on your balance sheet. Um, and it seems to me that one of the arguments that you are making here is that we need to think about externalities, just not just as they how they relate to the environment, but also for care labor. And I, I wonder what it might do to think about both of those things in terms of externalities, in terms of things that we previously did not account for, but need to account for um, in kind of an, a, a future that is characterized by both, um, you know, environmental sustainability and by care labor. So the two key words that I wanted to bring up um, are emergency and stewardship. Um, you know, emergency is maybe kind of an odd one, but it stood out to me, you know, a couple of points that you made in the course of the paper. You know, it stood out to me that emergency or just to declare something as a state of emergency has some really interesting political effects. And you gave the example of California's use of incarcerated people to fight fires. Um, I think that this is an example of an emergency situation uh, being a form of justifying extreme exploitation of undercompensated, sometimes uncompensated, certainly unfree labor. Um, but on the other hand, emergency is sometimes used to justify quite extremely high wages. If um, so, if you if you're thinking about um, it, any kind of emergency that is going to have you know an immediate jeopardizing effect certain workers certain categories of workers are able to use that as a way to demand much higher wages than might be possible if thing if if we were not in the declared state of emergency um one example of that which is quite um contrary to the broader goal of having you know environmental sustainability is in the case of the workers who fight oil rig fires people who who are kind of contracted to go in and put out an oil rig fire who are often able to garner you know, very high wages because there is this emergency that is jeopardizing oil infrastructure, sometimes jeopardizing the production of oil itself. Um, and that made me wonder if there is a way to weaponize or at least use the language of emergency to you know, really bring into focus the way that valuing care work is a is a path out of the kind of environmental and ecological crisis that we find ourselves in is there a, if we reframed this in terms of ecological emergency are there then more levers to pull on to you know bring more people on board to bring more kind of attention and urgency and perhaps more recognition and higher wages to the kind of labor that is so crucially vital to um, you know, the future of the planet. The other word that I wanted to pull out was stewardship. And this is a word that, um, ironically, I've been thinking about a lot um, for, a, for a different project. But it's a word that I see arise a lot in, you know, environmental studies literature. And I have a complicated relationship with it. Um, partly because of other places that I've seen it shown up. So I don't want to do the really hacky thing of like reading the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition, but um, if I were to do such a thing, you know, if you look up the, the kind of definition of stewardship, often definitions include two words that I see as actually quite contrary to each other. Um, and one of those is care, taking care of, which is often part of the definition of stewardship. And the other is management. Um, the idea that a steward is someone who is in charge of managing resources. And I think that stewardship, that those are both accurate ways of defining the word. And I also think that they are almost opposite concepts, at least for me, because for me, caretaking 
is really the opposite of managing something. Managing to me calls to mind um, having some kind of mastery over, certainly dominating, uh, being able to dictate, being able to determine um, a a best path forward. And I think that there has been a very powerful strain of environmental thinking and environmental management that is drawn on that set of ideas. I think that's also linked to a very masculinist uh, view of what it means to be in charge of the environment, to use the environment to the best uses of the highest uses of uh, humankind, often actually would be termed as mankind. Um, But I think the care version is really different. I think that, that if to think about an ethic of care towards the environment is a much more ecological and holistic way of approaching um, environmental use. Um, And I think that it's also something that would prioritize, you know, not use at all, but but longevity and um, sustainability over what human beings can get out of a resource. Um, And, the word stewardship, you know, part of my own personal complicated relationship with it is because it's kind of a, um, a buzzword in certain strains, um, of especially kind of Protestant Christianity. And I think in those, certainly not in all, but I think in some of those circles, it's much more linked to the kind of managerial masculinist version and kind of draws on Genesis 2.15 and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Uh, which I think, you know, we could, we could do a whole close reading of that passage and what it, it calls to mind. So I, I think I mostly am just saying this as a word, uh, you know, it, as a way to say that I, I think that stewardship is a quite imprecise word that I, that carries a lot of risk and that it, I, 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 I think it would, it's, it's beneficial for us to have a conversation about what do we actually mean by stewardship, what kinds of ethics does it do, does care work really prioritize? And how can we make sure that when we are talking about environmental sustainability, we are encouraging ethics and approaches that are towards one side of that definition and not towards the other. Um, Just in closing, I, I was thinking a lot about how another way of framing the kind of excellent work that you're doing is in terms of metaphorical energy economies, Um, not an energy economy that is about oil or natural gas or even solar, but an energy economy that's about, you know, how we direct our own collective energy that will leave us able to have a planet, you know, that, that lasts beyond our lifetimes. Um, And I wonder if that's a metaphor that's, Perhaps it's just fun, but maybe it's something that you could kind of that that's worth drawing out and thinking about um, in 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 terms of you know drawing to a head the relationships between care work and um, environmental futures. Uh, so, just in closing, I want to thank you so much, Alyssa, for this really thought provoking work, and I really look forward to the rest of the conversation.